I have to believe there are a lot of people listening to us, maybe not so much because I don't think my audience is quite where I'm going, but, but there, there are going to be people who yeah. understandably come at this and are really judgmental and their narrative is going to be the following. These goddamn preschools trying to tell me a kid has, you know, yeah. ADHD. Maybe it's because the preschool's just overcrowded and the people who work at the preschool are too lazy to actually let these kids play. Let kids be kids. You know, there's nothing wrong with a kid that's hyperactive. You just got to give him more to do, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. This is sacrilege that we would ever give a child medication just because they're hyperactive. So that's a narrative. Yeah, for sure. Now, Again, I don't think a lot of people, if they're sophisticated, subscribe to that because I think a person who's sophisticated would hopefully not make a judgment like that without understanding the fact base a little bit more. Would you agree that the best argument against that logic, which is not an argument that says every kid should be on medication, it's an argument that says you have to weigh the pros and the cons of being unmedicated and what the impact on your education is going to be. Um, and the long-term success you're going to have as an adult, as a well-adjusted adult, versus the the accepted risks of any medication and the potential upside it has towards allowing that child to learn. Because again, I, I always like this framework you have, which is you bring it back to what is the adaptation of the condition? What is the adaptation of the phenotype? Yeah. If it is disruptive, if this is a difference in a child's education, if this is the difference between a kid going to college and not, if we believe that matters anymore, or being successful in their career or not, or having you know pro-social relationships versus not, then maybe we accept the risks of medication. So, so maybe you can articulate that more eloquently if you have a different view, but that's, that's kind of how I like to think about things that seem at the surface absurd. Yeah, no, I, I I love all the the points you brought up because it is a risk benef benefit um, you know ratio that you have to consider. You have to consider there's risks in everything we do. There's risks in all medications. There's risks in everything, so you have to consider both risks and benefits. When I'm working with a family, I talk to them about like the research. And we actually have a lot of research around safety and long-term outcome and the outcome of individuals with ADHD who are left untreated. But actually, more importantly, I get to know their child, though. See, so this thing I share, like, as I get to know them, I share with them the research, the safety research, all mm -hmm. sorts of information about the medication. But what's really important, so this is the idea about me going and watching the child in class, me talking to the teachers. I getting to know that family more, really understanding, like they come to see me for a reason. If things were great, they wouldn't come to see me. They've come to see me for a reason. And even though the school, you know, maybe initially it was the school who said like, your, your little guy is way too busy and you need to see a doctor about this. But when I get to know the family, I find out, well, actually dinner is really stressful and bedtime routine is really stressful. And like there's often yeah. everyone's in tears in the morning. Um, and so I get to know them and it's actually that personal part that helps them understand their child and I come back to self-esteem. Yeah. So their, their kid is not a statistic to you. Yes, that's exactly it. And that's how, um, and, and some, sometimes we don't use medication. I am the first to say, if your child doesn't need it, we're not going to use it. Although we know that medication can make a really big difference in kids with what, ADHD. What are the so so I've I've discussed this on some yeah. previous podcasts. So yeah. uh, is Vyvanse still used? Is Ritalin still used? Is Focalin used? I mean, what are what's in your toolkit? In yeah, that, in yeah, that, in that in that world. Yeah. So um, ADHD medicines. We're talking stimulants and non-stimulants. Mm -hmm. uh, first line treatment considered is stimulants. Within stimulants, um, we have two different medications. We have one called methylphenidate and one called um, amphetamine. Methylphenidate, we have many brands. That's the Ritalin, which has you know been around since I believe like the 1950s. Um, we've got Ritalin, we've got Focalin, we've got Concerta. We have lots of different methylphenidates. They all have different ways of... What was the other one after Focalin? Concerta. Yeah, okay. Concerta. Um, and there's many more brands. They're all different brands. They all have different like- and how do they differ? Are they differing in pharmacokinetics and half-life? Like what, what separates those three drugs, for yeah. example? 
um, how the medication's released. Okay, so it's just a timing of release and timing pharmacokinetic. Timing of release and the mechanism of release. It's literally the same molecule. Yeah, it's the same active ingredient, methylphenidate. But it's interesting, kids respond differently to the different um, medications, the brands, because the release mechanisms are different. So some kids are sensitive. Some kids are- So in other words, at- if a kid comes in and you try one of these and you don't get the response you want, you don't necessarily abort the entire molecule, you might switch to a different- um, formulation. And I only say this because I can't tell you the number of parents I have spoken with yeah. who have said, my kid was on Ritalin. It was a disaster. Yeah. When they switched to Focalin, it got so much better. Yeah. Is that? That's exactly right. And so, and there's no science, unfortunately, to tell us which, which one's, one's going, to... going to work for your child. Yeah. Um, so you have to basically try a few. <clears throat> okay. And then the other one you said was just straight amphetamine? Amphetamine. So that's Adderall, mm-hmm. which has been around since the 1930s. And then there's, you mentioned Vyvanse, Vyvanse, Dexedrine. So there's medications um, in that group. And again, same deal. It's literally, the difference between Vyvanse and Adderall is release and kinetics. Yeah. Vi, uh, yes. Vyvanse is actually called a, a prodrug. It's actually just got a little molecule attached to it that needs to be cleaved in order for it to, to yep. work. But okay. they're all, yeah, the same. Again, it's very counterintuitive to people why you take a hyperactive kid and give them a stimulant. Do you want to just give the brief overview of why that works? Yeah. So the way these medications work is they uh, increase uh, dopamine and norepinephrine in the synapses between the brain cells in the parts of our brain that are important for executive functioning attention, inhibiting impulses. So the part of the brain, the prefrontal lobes, where that all the executive function attention happens, um, we have our brain cells have to communicate in order to see that behavior, attention. These medications, although they're called stimulants, what they do is they, they increase the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine in these synapses, the gap between the neurons, um, and they improve the electrical activity and communication between brain cells. What are the most common side effects you caution yep. parents about with these drugs? Yeah. So the side effects can be annoying, but they're not life-threatening. The most common one is decreased appetite at lunchtime if you're taking a medication that lasts the whole day. Mm-hmm. So there's medications that last three or four hours, which we used to use a lot a couple decades ago when I first started doing this. Uh, But about 20 years ago, we started using extended release a lot more. And so extended release is that it lasts like, you know, eight hours or 10 hours for the day or 12 hours a day. And so those medications impact your appetite at lunch. Uh, Breakfast and dinner are usually fine. Um, There's this chance that it impacts sleep onset which is really important because sleep is super important, kids. Yeah. But it can impact sleep onset, and if that's uh, a problem, we you know we adjust the timing of the of the medication in the morning. Um, but these are generally single administration first thing in the morning drugs. I yeah. Assume. So it's really they're really easy to use because you you take it in the morning. They start to work. The like the extended release will start to work within an hour. And then they're working for the majority of the day. Then they come out of your system at the end of the day. And so uh, tomorrow, um, unless you give the medication to your child again. um, It's like they've never been on it. It's like they've never been on it. What are the differences then between the Ritalin class and the Adderall class? Do you have any suspicion one way or the other as to which is going to be more effective if you were to prescribe Focalin versus Vyvanse? Yeah. So when I first meet a young child, I generally start with methylphenidate and that's what most clinicians do with little kids. And the reason for that is that the meta-analyses show that kids tolerate methylphenidate a tiny bit better than amphetamine, um, although amphetamine is a little bit more bang for your buck when you're treating the symptoms. Um, that being said, no kid is a, a statistic. Like every yeah. kid's different. So I have just as many kids on Adderall as I have on Ritalin. So um, interesting. Yeah. So I use, I have to say, I use every <laughs> single brand out there. Um, and, uh, but I, start with methylphenidate because it's shown to be tolerated better. You mentioned a second ago that 
if your kid's been on this drug every day for a year and experienced all these benefits and then they come off the drug, it's like they were never on the drug. Does that suggest that in the, in the, I hate to use the description this way, but I think you understand what I mean, in the drugged state, yeah. you don't get to do behavioral therapies that also have a positive impact independent of the drug, such that if the drug comes off, the phenotype is changing? Is that not to be expected? So I, I want kids to be actually practicing skills when they're on the medication. Yeah. In, in theory, they should be able to do a better job. It should be easier for them to practice the skills on the medication. Yes. So, so let me say a couple of things. So, um, so in theory, um, uh, when they're on the medication, they should be, it's easier for them to practice paying attention, controlling sure. your impulses, controlling your hyperactivity. In addition to that, this is where the behavioral parent training part comes in, which is actually now a, a recommendation that every family should have, um, should be doing. Training specifically for family, not just child. Tr yes. Okay. Amazing how powerful parents can be in modifying the behavior of their child. So parents undergo the training and the child might undergo some sort of therapy, regulation group. Uh, when they're older, they undergo executive functioning, coaching to learn organization and planning. So what it is, is you are trying to develop these skills. So um, when we practice something over and over and over again, not only we develop new like behavioral strategies, behavioral patterns, new habits, we actually positively impact the developing brain. That's neuroplasticity, which is one of my also my um, my passions is neuroplasticity. But we impact the brain through experience and our behaviors. Um, so when a child has ADHD. Um, it is a wonderful time to practice new skills and you actually impact neural networks. So does that mean that you're telling parents or at least holding out a hope that, hey, you know, your kid is seven or eight years old, we're gonna put them on Ritalin. Um, this might not be a lifetime thing. Is there, do, you have, do you give them that hope or do you not commit to anything one way or the other? I don't commit. Because I, I get asked that question all the time. Yeah for the types of medications I put patients on, yeah, right? If I yeah. put patients on a lipid lowering medication, yeah. generally their first question, once you get through the why should I be on this and what are the side effects, et cetera, is am I gonna be on this for life? Yeah. So what I tell family, so I have no crystal ball, yep. I can't commit, but I do have many, many patients who do eventually come off medication some of them, um, maybe they shouldn't have come off medication. They actually should stay on their medication. But I have many patients who come off and do really well. Is it naive to think that because ADHD primarily impacts the prefrontal cortex that you would see at least a subset of people when they reach their late teens as girls and mid-20s as boys, when they reach maturation of that part of the brain, that at least a subset of them should be able to develop potentially the skills to to overcome the the genetic component of this, or is that not necessarily correlated? No, I see a lot of kids who do who do um, find ways strategies to compensate, mm -hmm. um, and who do you know no longer need their medication as uh, teenagers or young adults. I have a lot of kids who are like that, um, but I think it's really important that they start early developing strategies and new behaviors. Um, I think that is really important in strengthening those neural networks. So what about the non-stimulant class of drugs here? Yeah, there's um, there are non-stimulants that we use. Um, there, um, one is called Stratera, um, which also um, acts on uh, norepinephrine and increasing the norepinephrine um, levels uh, in the synapses. Um, and then there is a couple of old blood pressure medications we use. One's called guanfacine, the other one's clonidine. Um, those are alpha-2 agonists. Um, so they act in a different way with closing um, channels in the postsynaptic um, neuron. So it's a different mechanism. But all of those medications also help with the, you know, the communication between neurons in the attention center in the brain. Um, the difference is the non-stimulants have to be taken every day. 
um, unlike the stimulants, in order for them to work. So meaning like um, they're taken every day and you need a steady state in your body. Yeah. Do you ever mix these two or is it one or the other? Oh, you mix them often. Okay. You do. And so often um, they do not have the side effects with the um, poor appetite. Um, and sometimes they can be really good with kids who have um, um, some emotional dysregulation, impulsive emotions. So we'll often use them uh, with a child who has a little bit of that irritability, emotional dysregulation. And sometimes we're using both the stimulant and the non-stimulant at the same time. Thank you.